<sighs> test, test, test. Man, this podcast has been such a downer lately. <laughs> it's no different now, man. This idea that 2021 was going to be better than 2020 is not happening. But I'm just walking through the snowy woods, trying to clear my head a bit, and I just thought I'd blab a little bit about... So back in the, like, man, it might have been the first episode of this podcast, but uh, when I was talking about this idea of writing a little bit every day, and how a good thing about it is that it's resilient, you know? No matter what weird crap is going on in your life. You probably won't stop writing entirely if you just, you know, if all you expect of yourself is a little bit every day. <laughs> and it's funny that I was saying how I didn't get a ton of writing done this year, maybe because of COVID, but uh, I was looking back through my old episodes a little bit, just reminiscing about traveling and stuff. And it's like the never ending pattern of like, when I was in uh, Amsterdam and Tokyo, it's like, well, I'm traveling, you know, my mind's other places. I'm soaking in all this new stuff. So I haven't been writing a ton. And then when I got back to Canada, it's like, oh, you know, I'm a little bummed that I'm back in Canada because I had like bank card problems and stuff. I wish I was still traveling. So my mind's uh, elsewhere, so I'm not doing a ton of writing. <laughs> and then COVID happened and it's like, well, COVID is legitimately making things fucked up. But this has been the fucking pattern for a long time. I just don't get a lot done on each day, but I still am doing stuff every day. But I remember I said really early on, like, I guess the real test will be if there's like a death in the family or something, if something really bad happens, then we'll see. Then we'll see how resilient this plan really is. And nobody's died yet, but it's not good. My dad basically has cancer. It's uh. He was having all these physical pains and, you know, he was trying to do physiotherapy type stuff and it just wasn't working. It just, he was in too much pain. And then they found that there was a tumor, like, next to his spine, near his spine. And in the short term, it's like, oh, this might not be the worst news. Like, at least he's, there's a reason, you know, he's not just, he's not that old. He's like 70, 71. You know, he's old, but he's not super old. So it's like, oh, well, there's a reason at least, you know, there's something that they can fix and work on and maybe it's benign. And they did some radiation and it shrunk down quite a bit and he was feeling better and he could walk in the short term, you know, feeling better. But unfortunately, it's not benign. It spread to his lungs and then this week we found out it also spread to his shoulder. And it's one of those situations where they said like five years ago, you'd probably have six months to live. Nowadays, you know, a year or two maybe. I mean, and who knows, there's always the like, hey, you could just buy some crazy miracle. Could all just be fine. But that seems very fucking unlikely more and more. Every week there's a new terrible prognosis of how much more cancer there is. So that's extremely depressing. And then, you know, I mean, my mom has taken it pretty well, but she is just kind of a tough-ass person, <laughs> you know? There's, like, upsides, I guess, to, uh, you know, she came from this uh, huge family. She has, like, 12, 11 or 12, I can never remember. A lot of brothers and sisters, and they didn't have a lot of money. And this part of Canada, Atlantic Canada, is pretty poor anyway. Pretty tough upbringing. Made her very resilient, so it's like one of those things where... It's pretty rare, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, she's, she's never big on giving hugs. I could probably count the number of I love you's on one hand, if, if any, honestly, I don't know. So it's the kind of thing where you're like, wow, I wish we were a little closer as a family. <laughs> but on the other hand, when stuff like this happens, in some ways it's, there's an upside. Cause my dad also from weird rural Quebec his family's really disconnected, even more so. So if anybody's really feeling this pressure, they're definitely keeping it to themselves. I gotta assume they are. I gotta assume it's very scary and lonely and weird. Like, my dad's been in the hospital this whole time. It's 
been like three weeks and I can't go see him because of COVID stuff. But since it's Canada, you can stay in the hospital and it does not bankrupt your fucking whole life, so that's nice. And by all accounts, he's just chilling, watching TV, and like he's, I don't know, it's weird. I feel like I'm more upset than he and mom are, which I mean, I'm sure I'm not. But on the surface, it seems like that. And my brother is just crazy, you know, it's like, there was the brief initial moment where it seemed like he sort of understood what was going on. But then that stress and pressure just makes his crazy schizophrenia get even crazier. So he's just all like, ah, well, it doesn't even matter. That's not my real dad and the conspiracy theory craziness. Talking to him is more upsetting than anything. I fucking, ugh, can't deal with it. And I was just thinking how, uh, how things really do change <laughs> of just, uh, well, I was just watching some little anime on my phone, just sitting on a park bench in the snow and <laughs> just, uh, watching stuff on my phone until my fingers freeze off just to get out of the house. I started watching this anime called Wonder Egg Priority and I don't know what it's about yet and I can't say if it's any good because I got two minutes into the first episode and there's just this weird dream sequence where this girl's talking to this like weird talking bug and it's like hey I'm gonna take you to this gacha machine that's like magical because it gives you whatever you want. And I just started thinking that, uh, she's like, I don't know, I don't want anything. And it made me think of like, yeah, you know, when you're a kid, when you're a little kid, what do you want? Probably nothing, just stupid toys and crap maybe. And then as you get older into your teens and like 20s maybe, it's like, what do I want? I wanna be famous, I wanna be known, I wanna be successful. I wanna travel out into the world and make stuff happen. And it's like, man, what do I want at this point? And it's like, dude, I just wish my brother wasn't crazy and my dad didn't have cancer. I don't really care about all this other shit. Like, like my dad has always been a big reader, but he doesn't really read the kind of books that I do. Like he's really into just kind of thrillers or kind of disposable stuff. But when I was a kid, he's the one who really got me into reading, you know, he was always like kind of recommending me books and stuff. And he used to do this thing when I was really little where he would just buy a bag of candy. And if I wrote, well, I don't remember how much, a page, a page seems like a lot, but I guess maybe a page in little kid writing is probably not that much. And he would give me one of the pieces of candy from the candy bag. <laughs> and. And I don't know how much that kind of direct, you know, reward system, like, I don't know, is that really why I'm a writer now? Like, it's probably not that so much. It's just, just putting that stuff in the wheelhouse, just making it seem normal. Of like, okay, yeah, my dad's always reading books and he's giving me books to read and I'm just writing stuff. It's just a, a thing. It just, just that it doesn't feel unnatural, you know, it just always was kind of this thing happening in my life. It certainly didn't hurt. And then I have those brief little thoughts of like, I mean, at the fucking rate that I go and how slow things are, if he's got a year to live, I don't know. I highly doubt that he's gonna see me get a book published. I am just a turtle. I am the turtle of all turtles. I am the slowest person. I think it's gonna happen slow and steady, but I don't think it's gonna be necessarily any time soon. And it's like weird anyway, because he wouldn't like the book that I'm writing. It's not his kind of book. He wouldn't really get it. And I just like, I just don't care, you know? It's like, I don't need to prove to him that his like writing training worked or I don't need to make him proud that I fucking put out a book. Like, it just doesn't matter. That stuff seems so, who gives a shit, <laughs> you know? The dude's on his way out. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. It doesn't matter what I'm up to. <laughs> well, even, I mean, this was years back, many years back, but I remember the last, I used to write letters to my grandparents once in a while, but, you know, usually just because I was kind of goaded to, of like, hey, you know, it's your grandma's birthday, write her a letter. And I remember the last letter I sent to my grandmother on my mom's side, it was about this book I was writing that had, like, uh, kind of non-rhyming poetry. It was based on Charles Bukowski stuff on his book, Betting the Muse. And I included some of my stuff in the letter. And when I think back to that, I'm like, uh, that's the last thing I sent to my grandmother is this pretentious hogwash. 
I mean, I guess I was still a teenager at that point, but it's like her, I'm sure her last thoughts about me were just like, oh yeah. I mean, again, she had 12 kids and a zillion grandkids. I'm sure she didn't have a lot of time to even think about what I was up to, but what little time she did spend was probably like, oh yeah, there's Keith, that's my pretentious grandkid. <laughs> you know, what a load of shit. So yeah, I don't know, it's not like, it hasn't like, oh, lit the flame under me, I gotta get my book published while my dad's alive. It's like, he doesn't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck either. Who gives a fuck about any of this? It's not important. Just hope that he's just alive at all. That's all that really matters. But all that being said, all that depressing bullshit being said, the stupid technique is still working, you know? I mean, I am still just writing a little every day. It's not a ton, but it's some. Things are still just plugging along. And eventually, like I said, I think I mentioned that he's been in the hospital like three weeks. It's almost starting to normalize a little. I'm just like, well, get the update from dad. You know, like the horror of it and the terror that happens initially, eventually it's just like, I bet it's even kind of boring for him, just being in the hospital every day. It's like, I bet he was scared at first, and then you just get used to it, I guess. You just get used to the new paradigm of like, hell, I'm just in the hospital watching movies all day. Reframing my expectations of like, again, I don't know, it's always like he didn't get hit by a bus. He's not in horrible pain anymore now that they've fixed the, the tumor near his spine. Is two years that bad? Is one year that bad? I mean, it's better than nothing. I don't know. The whole thing is just fucking weird and messy and fucked up. But yeah, I just kept slogging through it, writing a little bit every day, and I just, yeah, eventually things are just kind of normalizing a little. And my brain is just kind of going back to writing mode a little more. And I just thought I'd blab about a couple little things, because, you know, whatever. It's get my mind off stuff, right? I mean, maybe that's what... If I don't really care anymore about being a big, super famous person and being all successful and yada yada, maybe this is what is valuable about just being a writer person and just doing writing every day and just working toward writing is... You know, it's just something to focus on when there's no point focusing on anything else. Like, that's, I guess, the the main thing with all this, is just the, there's nothing you can do. He's in the hospital, they're looking after him. Whatever is the best possible course of action is happening. There's literally nothing I can do. I can't even go see the guy. So after like a week of just feeling horrible, and then another week of feeling pretty bad, and then by week three, it's like, well, yeah, I guess I'm just kinda reverting back to my normal little routine. So last episode I was talking about the story about the two girls on the island and one of them goes kind of nuts and how miserable that was to work on because it's so based on my crazy schizophrenic brother. And I did stop working on it because fuck that. <laughs> it's just so miserable. It's like fuck that. This is not the time. I'll get back to it later. But I did have some like thoughts about it that make it a little more approachable. So I was saying how it was, uh, it's split into two halves. It's like the half where the two girls are exploring the island and it's like a little bit fun, sort of an adventure story. And then the second half where we jump forward in time where one of the girls has gone really nuts. And that's the part that seemed just so horrible and overwhelming and I suddenly realized like, man, I never wanted to write this at all. Now that I'm here, I really don't want to. What the fuck was I thinking about this? But that first half, it was like a lot of little tiny chapters, like a whole shitload of them. Like 60 little one or two page chapters or whatever. And I remembered this idea I had for the second half, it kind of came back to me. That I was thinking maybe I could switch up the style, or instead of these little snapshots of their different days, what if the second half was just non-stop? What if it was just one long, awful chapter? <laughs> Because I was thinking that uh, since we're following the perspective of the non-crazy kid, 
but she could be under like enormous stress now that she really doesn't know what to do because this other kid who she's been looking after is going really crazy and is off living in the woods by herself and was just like seeing things and talking crazy shit and just everything is fucked up. So that's the younger kid that's losing the plot. So the older kid can't really sleep, is just always really, really stressed and just sleeps in these little tiny bursts, which is just something I've just been an insomniac my whole life. So I know what that's like, where you get in these jags where you just are so exhausted. You're just so crazy exhausted, but then you can only sleep for like two or three hours and you wake up again. It's like you just sleep just enough to have enough energy to wake up again. And it's just like crazy. Sometimes it goes on for days and days and it's like, what is fucking happening? It's pretty rare. It happens to me a lot less nowadays but I definitely know how that feels. And I thought that could be the situation here, so... So no more chapter breaks, because there's no real break in the day. There is no delineation between yesterday and today. Everything is just a weird long day. She's just awake at weird hours and just trying to sleep whenever she can. And it's just like this weird waking nightmare. And I remember I mentioned that to my friend Brad, who he's really, uh, he's kind of my only friend who I really consider a great writer, <laughs> you know? I mean, I don't have a lot of writer friends, to be fair. But Brad's the one guy that I'm like, man, this stuff's good. Like, if I ever got published, he's the guy that I'd point them to and be like, hey, by the way, look at this guy's stuff. You know, I'll vouch for this guy. But he mentioned, he's like, that sounds kind of miserable. That doesn't sound like a good time. I would not enjoy reading that one long mega chapter. And I was like, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but that's the idea. It's not supposed to be comfortable anymore. This whole thing is supposed to be a fever dream of awfulness. That was a while ago I came up with that idea. And anyway, I remembered about it. I'm like, oh yeah, so at least that's a plan. That's a, a method of approach of like, oh yeah, I should try that. Because like it's a tough needle to thread of like, trying to represent a crazy, difficult, uncomfortable situation, but you still don't want her to just be so miserable that people don't fucking read it, <laughs> you know? Gotta hit that balance, but I'm like, it's a good, it's a neat idea. It's something to try, that's for sure. And then the other thing I realized is I was splitting it in half in my mind, because I don't know, that's just how human brains work, I guess, right? When we're just trying to organize the chaos of the world, is like if the first half of the story is like this, and the second half is like that. So you just think of the halves as 50% and 50%. But they don't have to be like that, you know? My little 60 mini chapters that start the book added up to quite a lot of writing. And the idea of writing that much again, but in Nightmare World, is so fucking awful. Like, that's what I was saying last episode. I'm just like... Why would I ever want to do this? This seems so shitty and so terrible. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm out. But then it occurred to me, like, it can be... The two halves don't have to literally be halves. It doesn't have to be 50-50. It can be fucking 80-20. It could be 90-10. I don't know. Like, this end part doesn't need to be that long. And I don't think can be that long. I just don't even have that many notes for it because it's like like the crazy talk of a schizophrenic person it's weird like i tried talking to my brother i mean i just avoid talking to him these days but because of all the stuff with my dad like i tried talking to him the other day and it's just so awful and it's just like such crazy nonsense but it almost makes sense you know like that's what's weird about it or like if you just if you've ever like talked to like a crazy guy on a street corner somewhere or whatever. There's little runs that make sense, or like it almost seems like what they're saying makes sense. It almost connects and almost combines and almost comes together into like some kind of coherent point. And it just never does. It just keeps flying off into something else. And, and it's so weird because you can see the underlying person in there, or you can see that this is a human brain that has these like amazing cognitive 
potential abilities. It's there. It's just not working. It's not connecting. Nothing is firing properly. But how many times can you do that? You know, like, how many times do I need to display that? How many conversations does the older girl need to have with the younger girl? You know, we're going to get the point pretty fucking quickly. And to just continuously reiterate it over and over is tiresome, but also pointless. There's a limit to the value of crazy talk, you know? Eventually, it's just more crazy talk. So that helped too, where I realized, like, this doesn't need to be as overwhelming as it seemed. Maybe I'm not halfway. Maybe I'm almost at the end. It's just at the end, the end is always harder anyway. I'm noticing that with my main novel. Like, the more you write, the slower and more laborious it gets. The bigger the boulder that you're trying to push up the hill feels. And it's doubly so here, because this last 10 or 20% is so bizarre and so difficult. But it doesn't have to be long. So those are the things I realized. That the final part can be one big, long, fever dream mega chapter. But even still, it it doesn't have to be the other 50% of the book. So I feel like those ideas, like, they primed me. Of like, okay, this doesn't feel as insane anymore. This doesn't feel as hopeless and pointlessly impossible. (laughs) I'm still not going to work on it, but I could. You know, once I gather up my strength a little, once I'm feeling more up to it, I can see a way forward now. So, I mean, that's good. That's a bonus. Man, my fingers are freezing off. So let's just wrap this up kind of quick like But the one other thing I had in mind is that it is kind of interesting that in these trying times when bad stuff is happening, especially once things do settle down a little bit, that I guess it's just part of being a writer, but you're always like looking for ideas and looking for little inspirations and stuff. And it's just weird that they can come out of weird places and unexpected stuff. So this is other bad news, but it's just, it's not the same kind of bad news. It's just... (laughs) popcorn bad news. It's just silly bad news compared to the actual bad news of my dad being in the hospital. But the silly bad news is that it looks like we're done doing that little Buffy podcast me and my friends were doing about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Because we did season one and then we kind of had it on hold anyway because the holidays happened and we were kind of not feeling up to doing podcasting for a bit. And then all this family stuff happened and there's stuff with my Toronto friends going on too and it's just like, whew, let's just fucking give it a break. But then it's like the cosmos is like, you know what? You're definitely not doing this project anymore. Because all these allegations came out about Joss Whedon, the guy who wrote and created Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's hard to say at this point how bad they are. Hopefully it doesn't get super duper bad, but it's certainly not good. At the very least, a lot of people hate his fucking guts and just say he was a huge asshole and bullied people and treated people like shit. And it may get way worse than that. We'll see as more stuff comes out. But even if it's just that, it's like, man, it stretches all the way from back in the Buffy days to like 20 years later when he was working on the Justice League movie where people, that's where it first sort of came out, I guess, is people were like, what is up with this guy? This guy's a fucking piece of work. He's treating everyone like shit. What the fuck? And then actors from Buffy came out and said, yeah, you know what? I didn't want to say it at the time because you don't want to upset the fandom and like, oh, this is big Joss Whedon who created these shows, but he's a fucking asshole. That guy fucking sucked. Here's all the shitty stuff that he did. And it's like, oh man, (laughs) like we just can't do the podcast now because there really is like a bunch of great stuff in those shows. And I can't on the one hand be like, oh, and here's this genius thing that happens. And look at this cool example of awesome writing. But meanwhile, Asterix, the guy who did this, total fucking asshole. Everyone was having a real bad time making this show. (laughs) Like, fuck that. So I think we're hanging up that project. But one of the actresses who, she didn't get into specifics, but she was only uh, 15 when she was on that show, Michelle Trachtenberg. And she was just like, yeah, bad stuff happened between me and Joss, creepy stuff. And I'm not going to get into the details, but it ain't good. Everyone should know that this guy 
it's got a lot of problems and like let it be known and that's the part especially that it's like oh man what is that all about that could be real bad <laughs> that has to be creepy right that it's like man there's no way that's good and man there's so many times with this stuff i mean to me i still think bill cosby is the most shocking one to me because i grew up with bill cosby on the fucking jello pudding commercials and stuff and like kids say the darndest things and you're like really bill cosby holy fuck but it just happens over and over so many times the weird abuses of power and it's like you just can't be a fan it's not it's not a good idea to be a fan of other people i'm going to say men in specific but to just kind of put people on a pedestal and idolize them it's like you're just you're just setting yourself up to find out that these people are terrible fucking people when you put people in positions of power they abuse the positions of power. It's just how it fucking is. That's what little human being brains do. We're fucking dumb little monkey idiots and that's what we do. And it's gonna happen over and over. Whoever your big favorite is, whoever your big idol is, fucking quit it. Fucking quit it, because that person is a fucking asshole. That person is a piece of shit. <laughs> like, how many times? How many times does it need to happen? Anyway, so it happened again with Joss Whedon. But this girl, Michelle Trachtenberg, when she posted about this on her Instagram, I haven't, you know, been following her since the Buffy days. I haven't seen anything that she's posted or written since then. But she writes in this really unusual way, where she uses full stops a lot. She just keeps putting periods in the middle of the sentence. Like in this case, it was, you know, quite dramatic, talking about the Joss Whedon stuff of just like, he knows, period, what, period, he, period, did, period, you know, that type of thing. Which is just like, God, that's so creepy. <laughs> oh, man. But she does it kind of consistently and all the time. And, like, it's just, it's weird. I guess going back to my little pretentious fucking poems that I sent in the letter to my grandma back in the day, it kind of reminded me of that, of just, like, this is kind of, kind of weird and, like, I don't know, it's like a weird artsy way to write. In a way, it's kind of strange. It's like, you know, just kind of... I'm usually more of a fan of just being direct. Just being direct and unadorned and unflowery these days. <laughs> it would never occur to me to write something that way, especially when you're talking about something serious. It seems weird to me. But, I mean, hey, it's what makes people different. It's just she has a different weird way of communicating these things. And it kind of stood out to me because I'm like, that's so weird and like I just would never think to write like that. But it is very striking and it really does stand out. And it brought me back to this story. I've mentioned it before, but it's been a while. Because it's an idea I had some time ago and I just can never quite crack the fucking nut. I can never quite break ground on this thing. Where the idea is that it's a girl writing a psychographic diary, which is like writing to the dead. You're writing as though you're talking to a dead person. So the idea would be the book would be her diary and she's writing to her ex-boyfriend who she had to kill because he was like summoning demons and getting into all kinds of crazy shit. So the idea is she's kind of writing like, here's why I had to do what I did. But the idea is also in the story would be that she really is writing to him because of his weird demonology and stuff. He is dead, but you know, his spirit's still around or like through the dark arts, he's still hanging on. And she has to like battle him for the final time through this book. And I was like, I like this idea a lot, but there's something missing. There's just not enough for me to get going on this. And part of the problem is just that the stuff I've written so far is kind of just like all the other stuff that I write. It's like I kind of have my own little style and I don't tend to deviate from it that much. And it kind of, it's like that thing people say sometimes in movies and stuff that it feels like the author just talking to themselves, like every character has the same tone and the same kind of voice. That's kind of how I felt with this story is like, this story feels a lot like my other stories and the way that I present those, 
which I think is fine for those because, you know, they're just pros. It's just, hey, if that's my style as a, as a writer, that's my style. But this is supposed to be someone else. This is supposed to be a different person writing this diary. It's not me, but it sounds like me. And that just kind of got me stuck. So seeing these little horrible messages from Michelle Trachtenberg and just like reframing 20 years of Buffy fandom and just like, oh man, it's such a downer to know so many people on the set were going through such bad stuff and that all this like fun and nostalgia that we as fans have, it's such a bummer to know that the people on the show don't feel that way. That when they think back, they think back to this tyrant auteur that was fucking ruining their lives. It's like, ah oh, man, that fucking sucks. And if nothing else, it ruined my fucking podcast. <laughs> Fuck you, Joss Whedon, you dick. You ruined my podcast, you fucking asshole. But this weird way that Michelle Trachtenberg wrote, even though it was almost like on the surface a little bit cloying, a little weird, it's like, why are you writing like that? That seems sort of affected and strange. Like, it's not how I would have written this. <laughs> but that made me think like, oh, but that's kind of cool. That's not how I would have written this. What if, even just as an experiment, even if I don't do the whole book this way, but just as something to try to kind of get the gears moving, to try to push forward a little bit, what if I try that? What if I give the character in this story a weird, affected way of writing? And I'll start by making it just the same way Michelle Trachtenberg wrote on her Instagram. And as I go, hopefully I'll kind of develop my own version of it, you know? I won't just be aping her exact affectations. I'll like find my own happy middle. But that idea kind of like made me like, oh yeah, kind of excited about that story again. Because especially it's like, if someone's writing a diary, and not only a diary, but a diary to a person that they know so intimately that they, they literally killed that person. It shouldn't be a prim and proper prose writing style. It shouldn't come off as just the, the narrative from a novel, you know? I mean, if we've learned anything from the age of text messaging, it's that most people do not write in a super fancy pants, proper formal style. They use weird contractions and strange sentence constructions and limited punctuation and emojis and all kinds of fucking weird shit. So to some degree, that's how this book should be also. I don't want to overdo it. But if it was just this little intimate journal between you and another person and there's never any intention that anyone else in the world would ever see it, it would be disingenuous to write everything out in a very staid, prose, proper method. So yeah, I got that idea from <laughs> these bad circumstances of the unraveling of the legacy of Joss Whedon. Certainly didn't expect that. I didn't expect that to happen at all. Although even on that Buffy podcast, I mean, there's already a little like trying to put out fires where it's like, yeah, you know, his, his ex-wife did write a big essay about him a few years ago, and it wasn't good. About how he's a fake feminist and people should know that this guy's real two-faced and he's not who he presents himself. And then the guy who played Spike on Buffy had this story where Joss like literally backed him into a wall and kind of like was really angry at him because his stupid character was popular. And he's like, I'm not gonna we're not changing the story just because you're popular. Your character was supposed to die. He's going to die. And Spike was like, whatever, dude. I don't care, you fucking nerd. <laughs> you know, who gives a shit? Calm the fuck down. Like, there was little stories like this popping up about how this guy was not cool. But I did not expect it to fucking snowball like this. But out of it... It's like the beautiful flower that came out of the pot of dirt <laughs> is I got this idea for one of my stories. So I guess, I don't know, I guess that's all the point I'm trying to make is that 
You never know. You can get ideas from weird places. Even when things are bad, maybe something good will come of it. As of now, I have not gleaned any inspiration or positive ideas or anything from my dad being in the hospital. But the interpersonal strife of the set of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, sometimes there's interesting things to glean from those situations. So yeah, anyway, thanks for listening. Nice little walk through the woods, ramble out my stuff, get my mind off my problems for a little while. Hopefully this podcast can get back to being sort of fun at some point. That would be nice. But I don't know, dude. Life is not very fun lately. In fact, here, let's end. This is a really short song, but let's end with a super depressing song. So the dude Jamie Lenman, way, way back, when I was talking about the song that's like my anchor song for this novel, the song that if there was a trailer for the movie, this is the song that would go in. It was written by Jamie Lenman. It's this really loud, crazy, bombastic, fucking hardcore song. But that album that came from was a double album. Half of it was loud and insane, and the other half was quiet acoustic songs. And he has this one song called Saturday Night that I fucking, I always hated this song. But not because it's a bad song. It's a beautiful song, but it's about his dad dying. And I just always hated listening to it because it just makes me think about like someday my parents are gonna die. It's like, ugh, you know? It's just one of these little pretty little songs that just cuts right in, it just cuts right through. And it's just like, fuck. It just puts you right there in that moment. It's like, I don't wanna be in that moment, Jamie. (laughs) I don't wanna think about that. But I'm a lot closer to that moment now, so let's listen to that. My old man died on a Saturday night. I watched as he just stopped breathing. It's fucking super depressing. So here's that. I'll talk to you next time. My old man died on a Saturday night. I watched as he just stopped breathing. I know it was awful and painful and sad. I was glad that he wasn't alone It felt like something he just had to go through An arduous task he'd been given And it seemed so unfair it was his cross to bear The sickest and weakest of us Oh, we never spoke much as a father and son But we had an understanding And I still hear his voice when I open my mouth In anger or wisdom or such Oh, if I see a similar jacket or hair I think for a moment I found him But then I remember it's not about where And I know he's not lost, he's gone, yeah I'm just glad that he wasn't